my lovely, lovely imps. Today, we are going to talk about detransition. And detransition is a, it's so strange to me that it's become such a huge topic. Um, because previously, detransition was a topic that I literally only ever heard of in intertrans communication. Never had heard it from anybody else until very recently. For those who don't know, if you're a new viewer to my channel, I am a trans woman. Uh, and I have been transitioned for a very long time now. Uh, and on hormones and, and all kinds of stuff. We'll talk about that as we um, I've been in trans communities for a very long time, longer than I've been transitioned as a term. Um, and detransition has become a strangely popular topic in political discourse, uh, mostly driven now by the far right. Um, and I find it really strange for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, trans people represent a fairly small percentage of the population. Um, you know, the highest estimates say somewhere over, you know, 1% of the American population is likely trans. Um, I think it's probably a little bit higher than that because there are a lot of people who are still very afraid of being open about their status of being trans. But regardless, a pretty small percentage of the population is actually trans um, of any type. Um, and so it's very strange to me to see, um, the topic of detransition, um, be pushed and, and discussed so strongly by right-wingers, um, as like a sort of political talking point. For those who don't know, the term detransition refers to when a trans person, um, basically stops transitioning. Say you have someone who is assigned male at birth, they ta start taking hormones, they decide to stop. That is a detransition. They are stopping their transition from male to female. Um, that is what the term refers to. However, um, in the political discourse, detransition has come to have a lot of very specific connotations. And so I feel like it's very necessary that we have a discussion about detransition. And I'm gonna start this by um, talking about some cold hard facts about detransition. Um, the simple matter, uh, uh, or the simple fact of the matter is that there is a lot of misinformation around detransition. Uh, like I mentioned, the far right has become very obsessed with this concept of detransition. And they are, I, I, if you're a right winger who's watching this, I encourage you to please take this, you know, be strong, don't run away when you hear this. But the far right is not honest in their presentation of detransition. In fact, they are so dishonest that it actually uh, undermines even their own belief system. Um, the dishonesty around detransition is so drastic. So I want, I feel the need to, to, to put down some cold, hard facts, okay? As in, not your feelings, but facts. Detransition is incredibly uncommon. Like, remarkably uncommon. I mentioned already that trans people represent a very, very tiny population of the world. Well, detransitioners represent a tiny, tiny percentage of that tiny, tiny percentage. A recent U.S. study, which talked to nearly 30,000 trans people, that's a huge study, by the way. Um, that study showed that uh, only 8% of all of those people studied reported some kind of detransition. And 62% of that 8%, so the majority of that 8% uh, 
said that they had only temporarily detransitioned due to societal, financial, or family pressures. Which means that even if we consider all other reasonings for detransition like as exactly the same, that means that less than 4% of all trans people will ever like detransition, like actually detransition, like stop transitioning permanently. And keep in mind that we have other data, though it's a little bit harder to, to get exact numbers, that shows that a lot of people who detransition end up retransitioning. I am one such person. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But there's the there's a cold hard fact for you. That was a recent massive study of trans people. Four percent actually stop transitioning for any other reason other than being forced to. Okay. In the if you don't think that study is good enough, in the UK, a recent study of nearly four thousand patients, three thousand three hundred and ninety eight patients of a gender clinic found that of those 3,398, only 16 expressed regret for their transition, which means that it was a rate of 0.47%, less than 1% even expressed regret, let alone detransition. That's not enough for you. Um, the A Swedish 50-year longitudinal study, which focused on 800 trans people, and studied uh, their lives and data about them over fi over 50 years, found that of those people, only 2% expressed regret. And by the way, if anybody wants to look into this for themselves, I'm gonna provide this, this particular study. I have the full study available right here. So there you go, in case anybody has any questions. So there you have it. Out of those 800, only 2% expressed any regret. And then, of course, in the Netherlands, a uh, study undertaken by Ristori and Fisher, you can look this up, called Gender Affirming Clinical Care Pathway for Adolescents, found that among trans youth, only 1.9% of youth who started puberty blockers ever decided to not continue their medical transition. So of people, of, of trans youth who got puberty blockers, less than 2% decided to, to, to stop. Okay? And you can look that one up. I don't have a direct link for that one, but it's Restory and Fisher, uh, Gender Affirming Clinical Care Pathway for Adolescents. It was uh, published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine. Okay? Now, a lot of right-wingers will hear these numbers and go, wait, wait a second, wait a second, hold on a minute, I've heard another study. And I'm going to talk to you about that study right now before we get any further. That is the most frequently cited study by anti-trans uh, demagogues, I'll call them demagogues in this particular case, because they are. They are hyper-obsessed and they have a vested political reason to oppose trans people. This is called the Steensma study. Um, you probably have heard that name. And the Steensma study um, uh, is the one where people will say 80% of trans kids stop transitioning. And that is a complete and utter misrepresentation. And I can explain exactly why it's a misrepresentation, but also if you decide to look even a little bit deeper, you'll discover that even the people who did that study have since denounced the way that that study has been used because people misrepresent the study. I'm going to explain it right now. In the Steensma study, desistance, which is different and distinct from detransition, but desistance was, uh, was, was defined as any child who ever expressed any gender questioning whatsoever not deciding to transition. Now you might go, well, what, is that, what does that mean? That means that even a kid who, uh, who one day just sort of said, oh, I, I want to be this gender, 
and then just then you know never really brought it up again or decided to pursue just dis- uh uh pursue transition or anything like that that would be counted as a desister which right wingers will then say detransitioner so this study had a huge issue which is that um children who never even began the process of transition or children who tried social transition, meaning no hormone surgeries or anything like that, but just said, I want to try what it feels like to to be called she, her, or he, him, and then said, okay, actually, this isn't for me. Um, those children were considered desisters, which is then misrepresented by right-wingers as detransitioners. So... For those who are listening who aren't necessarily lefties like myself, uh, who aren't necessarily super pro-trans like myself, I want you to recognize that you have been misled about this study. And I want you to challenge you to go engage with the study yourself. It is publicly available. Just search the Steensma study. It has been reposted and mirrored all over the internet. You can go and read the study itself and you can discover that what I'm telling you is the truth that this does not actually represent people who got to the point of taking hormones or surgeries. That actually, as it turns out, getting to that point is pretty difficult and takes a pretty solid investment and understanding of yourself to ever even get to the point of starting hormones or or, uh, pursuing surgeries. Now, all of these things are important to understand because... There's more to this conversation around um, around detransition, um, and uh, what conservatives, the the far right, want people to believe about detransition is that a uh, detransition is a common occurrence because trans people are rushing into gender transition that they are being convinced by doctors and parents and mysterious unnamed individuals to transition themselves and that they wake up one day as if from a dream and go what have i done i'm a beautiful woman or a sexy man oh that's what they want you to believe they want you to sell this idea that trans people Um, are being manipulated somehow into transitioning in the first place when of course the reality is so far from that that it is actually difficult to get treatment as a trans person that there is very little support statistically for trans people trans people's parents are often unsupportive trans people's communities are often unsupportive um this uh, this misinformation is designed to cr- scaremonger. It's designed to create a moral panic around the concept of transition by hyper fixating on the stories of a handful of cherry picked detransitioners. Of course, now that you know the facts about detransition, that it is remarkably uncommon, um, and also that. Uh, uh, that most of most people who um, actually don't really want to pursue transition never do. They don't ever even get to that point. They go, those people that the conservatives are saying, oh, what if you're just gender confused? Well, those people don't tend to start hormones. They figure it out in the process. That's that's what you want, isn't it? You you want them to to figure it out, right? Well, the truth is, of course, that the far right doesn't really care about any of this. They don't care about the facts. They don't care about detransitioners. They don't care about trans people. They simply want to fear monger. They want to create a moral panic that makes people feel like their way of life is under attack. They want to frame trans people as corruption, as a corrupting influence and the individual detransitioners as people who have realized their corruption and tragically regret it. But of course, that's just not really borne out in reality. While of course there are people who decide this is not for me, their stories don't look like the detransitioners that get put forward by a lot of right-wing 
talking heads. Their stories are generally not one of trans ideology, but rather a deeply personal experience um, with coming to terms with their own life and their own limitations. Some people detransition because of a medical issue. Wow, I bet you didn't know that. Did you know that some people who choose to detransition do so because they have an issue with their liver that makes it dangerous for them to take HRT, which is, you know, a part of physical transition? Did you know that another group of people who are considered detransitioners are simply non-binary people who say, I want to do this part of transition, but not that part? And because of the way that the... Um, like, for example, uh, somebody who perhaps wants hormones but does not want to get an invasive surgery, some, some uh, medical institutions will consider that person a detransitioner or a desister because for that institution, they've decided that surgery is the ultimate goal. But in truth, there are lots of trans people who don't want surgery. They're happy with hormones, but they'll be considered detransitioners anyway. I want to tell you a personal story now, now that we've laid out the cold, hard facts of detransition, that is not very common, that the reasons for detransition are totally misrepresented. I want to tell you my personal experience transition because I detransitioned at one point in my life and now I have retransitioned. I live my life as a woman. And I am identified as a woman, and people treat me like a woman. And it's great, and I'm really, really happy. It's easily the wisest decision I ever made in my entire life. But I wanna tell you about why I detransitioned. You're gonna have to travel way back in time, okay? When I first came out as trans, when I first discovered that I was trans, um, I, well, the first time I ever knew of myself as being different was when I was around nine, eight or nine years old, very young. The first time I first ever encountered trans feelings. But at that time I was, uh, a, my family was a part of an extreme Christian cult a very extreme Christian cult. I had no exposure to a concept such as being transgender. I had no concept, I had barely any exposure to the idea of being gay or anything like that. Um, so I, at the age of like eight, um, had like had very distinct uh, feeling of, of, of oh, I, like this is not the way that I want to be. Um, and I had had other things before that, um, though my family had not joined the cult until around that age. So previous to that, um, my family was not super, super, super religious. Um, they were mildly religious, but I was more or less allowed to do whatever. Um, I, I had a lot of, when I was a kid, uh, most of my friends were girls. Um, I was very, very comfortable with my sort of free gender expression, and I didn't feel like policed uh, to be um, to be a, one way or another. And of course, that changed when we joined the cult, and that is when I started having these trans feelings, where I was like, I want to be like the girls. I think I'm a girl, and um, I didn't know what it was at the time. Many years later, when I got out on my own and was in college, I discovered what being trans meant, and realized that I was trans. And that was a very, very uh, uh, shocking and, uh, and life-changing moment. And uh, after I started to think on it a bit and, and research it on my own and, and think about it and go back and forth on it and talk to some close friends about it, um, I decided that I would come out to one of my family members. Um, that family member promptly outed me to another family member who uh, then went on a total rampage through my entire family, basically telling every single member of my family uh, their version of 
my uh, confession, their, their version of my coming out. It was an incredibly traumatic incident. Um, and, uh, and it was very difficult for me at the time to go from opening up to somebody who I believed I could trust to suddenly having my whole family talking about me, messaging me, questioning me and being very strange. And um, at that moment, I was resolute because I knew how long I'd been experiencing this. I knew what I wanted to do, that I wanted to transition and live my life as a woman, that that would make me happy. I knew it. I knew it in my heart. And so I stuck by it. And that led to basically the complete uh, disassembly of my life. Um, in the following weeks, um, mostly my father uh, uh, engaged in uh, all kinds of controlling behavior, um, everything from uh, cutting off my communications because I was an adult, but still relied on the family for a lot of things. I was on a family cellular plan. I had a, a, a shared bank account with my parents still. Um, I relied on them to be able to go to college because of financial aid. And um, basically, he put me in a position where uh, I was cut off completely from everything. Um, and uh, that continued for a very long time to the point that ultimately, and I don't want to tell the whole story of this because I've talked about this elsewhere, it was very rough. I went through a lot during that period, and a lot of it was driven by specific family members who were very, very religious and felt like what I was doing was ungodly or evil. Um, and I eventually was disowned completely um, by my family. My sort of patriarch of our family literally said, you should change your last name. You, we do not want you. You are not wanted here. Go away. You're not a part of the family. And um, shortly after that, I was um, kicked out of my family's home. Um, which I relied on at the time because in the in the sort of financial chaos following my being forcibly outed to the family, I had to go back home. I had nowhere else to go. I couldn't, they wouldn't, like, I couldn't pay for college anymore. So my only option was to go back home. And then I got kicked out of that. It was only because of a friend that I was even able to find a place to live. During that period, I remained fairly strong. I had begun transition. I had started hormones after a lot of work. It took months of me to talk, uh, talking to therapists and doctors to be able to get the hormones, to be able to make sure that I could get what I needed. I even had already had to, previous to that, I had had to go to a Christian counselor who encouraged me not to transition. Um, it's a whole other thing. Um, and uh, ultimately, I got to the point where I was, I was on hormones but I was poor, extremely poor. I was struggling to stay afloat. I was struggling to stay mentally well because I was living um, off of the charity of a friend because I, ha I, I was trying to, I had work, but I didn't have any savings or anything like that. And, um, and uh, I had recently been homeless. And as this went on, my struggles continued. And um, even after being disowned by my family, certain family members continued to basically make attacks against me in one way or another, specifically my father. Um, my father was, um, he was very aggressive. He would send letters uh, that were cruel and strange. He would make threats at me. And uh, this went on for a really long time. And eventually, uh, the state of my life had become so miserable. I was dying, trying to pay my bills, trying to stay ahead. I had my, my dreams of, you know, I, the college that I went to was very important to me. I had worked very hard to get into college. That had been completely destroyed. There was no chance of me going back. Um, you know, I had had to live this very, very tough existence. Um, my whole family had stopped talking to me. 
And my father, while after having disowning me, was sending me cruel letters on a regular basis and had begun to threaten me. And at the peak of that, I basically had a mental break. I had a moment where I, where I realized, um, partially because I had started to, um, I had found my way into anti-trans spaces on the internet. Um, at the time it was 4chan. Um, this was, of course, like I was not a leftist at this time. This was, you know, within a year or two, a, a, maybe three years, I think, at, at, of having left a cult. So, you know, I was very politically uh, drifting. I didn't know where I was because I had just left a cult. And so I had found uh, through Grapevine, you know, this anti-trans stuff online that I sort of was reading. And um, I wasn't really, a, no, I wouldn't categorize myself as a channer. I just, people would, like, I would find stuff. And at the time online, trans spaces, in fact, most of the trans spaces I, I spent time on were not on 4chan. But um, in the midst of all of this pain, I found myself reading things that hurt uh, because they felt like the truth. Felt like when I read that, for, you know, somebody posts a 4chan thread saying, you're never gonna be a woman or whatever. Um, that felt true because I was in pain. And eventually it got to the point where I realized, like I said, realized um, that there was no hope for me being trans. That uh, my family would never accept me, that I would never get jobs, um, that I would never have, uh, you know, a loving partner or, and that people would reject me forever. And in a moment of extreme uh, duress and stress, I threw all of my hormones out. I took my hormones and I literally emptied them bottle by bottle into a trash can full of garbage so that I couldn't get them back out. And I decided to detransition. And I stopped asking, I stopped having my friends, my close friends use my pronouns. I mostly withdrew. I stopped socializing with people completely and I tried to fix myself. Um, and I failed utterly. I miserably failed. I was miserable. I was in agony. Um, my trans feelings never stopped. I never stopped wanting to be a woman. I just repressed it severely. And, um, and it took me about a year and a half to get back out of that. So there was a, there was a, um, there was this year and a half where I had stopped completely and I just desperately tried. It was terrible. During that period of time, I thought that I needed to like hyper masculinize. And so I tried and I failed because it wasn't me. And I felt miserable doing it. I hated it. I felt like I needed to force myself to just try and break myself of it. And it didn't work. And I found myself at the end of it more broken than than I had ever been in my entire life. I was more miserable even than when my family was tormenting me. It was the most miserable I'd ever been because I wasn't even myself. I had divorced myself entirely from my genuine self. And um, it took me basically putting myself through a uh, an internal mental conflict with transphobia to finally get out of it. What I basically did was I said, I can't do this anymore. I need to pit the ideas like anti-trans and pro-trans ideas against themselves in the arena of my mind. And so I did. I went and pursued the best pro-trans arguments and the best anti-trans arguments I could possibly find. And I pitted them against each other in my mind. And I had this moment of realization where I realized it was almost, it was like almost like when I left Christianity where I realized how bullshit the anti-trans arguments really were, that how much of they were just inspired by pain and repression. And, I, and then I decided I just made this impulse and I called my doctor and I was like, 
it was it was one of the hardest things I did. I remember that I I viscerally remember where I was and and what it felt like to call my doctor. I thought my doctor was going to be mad at me for some reason, but I called my doctor and I was like talking to the um receptionist. I was like, "Hi, um I haven't had an appointment in a year and a half. I wasn't doing very well and um I forgot to rebook my appointment. Can I get uh can I you know, can, can I come in and have my blood work done and get my prescriptions updated? And the lady was, and I was terrified that they were going to be like, uh, get out of here, you fraud. You're a fake trans person. And I was, and they were like, no, no, it's fine. That's totally fine. We'll do your blood work and make sure your blood work is fine. And you can come in and talk to the doctor and let them know what's been going on. And it was that easy to come back. Obviously getting there in the first place was pretty difficult. Um... Well, the money wasn't very much, but yeah. Um, so, uh, and that was when I went back on hormones and I have never doubted my path even once since then, um, since that moment. But I did completely and utterly stop pursuing transition at all and stopped identifying as trans and even secretly. I stopped doing it even in private uh, during that period. So you can kind of get an idea of why I detransitioned at that time and also why I came, why I decided to continue transitioning. Um, I don't think it's fair to call me a detransitioner because I didn't detransition. I just stopped for a while and then ended up going back. And as it turns out, that's a lot of people. There are a lot of people out there and I know them personally, but they're also reflected in data there are a lot of people who stop for one reason or another. Very frequently, it's for reasons like mine. It's because they have a family that's abusing them for being trans. They have an environment that tells them that they're somehow worse just for being trans, that they're somehow evil or wrong or flawed. And I just want to be clear. I know that this isn't really a core part of the video, but you are 100% 100% valid, okay? No matter what these, these politically motivated, cruel freaks try to tell you, your feelings are real, your feelings are important, your right over your own body and over your own identity is yours, okay? You have a right to determine what you, how you live. You get one life on this earth and you have a right to live it how you desire true to yourself, honest with who you are on the inside, okay? You have a right to that, no matter what anybody says, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how much it stings, even if it feels like it's true. Trust me, your autonomy is sacrosanct, okay? Your ability to live as who you are and your right to do so and your, and your correctness for standing by your guns uh, those are all inarguable, okay? I wasn't perfectly worded, but that wasn't really the intention of this segment. The intention of this segment is to bring attention to the manipulative way that detransition has become uh, talked about in many, many spaces. And to give people some insight, personal and statistical, about the real meaning of, of detransition in trans communities. And of course, I want to end this off by pointing out once again how evil and twisted and inhumane and manipulative the far-right fixation on detransition is. Stay out of trans people's business. Stay out of it. I want us to go back to the time when detransition was something that was discussed compassionately and lovingly between trans people trying to deal with the difficult parts of their lives in as healthy a manner as possible. Talking with each other, sorting things out together, watching out for each other, assisting each other. I want people who decide to detransition on their own to be able to do so of their own volition. Not pressured, not tortured, not financially starved. I want them to be able to, if they decide that it's not for them, that I want them to do that of their own volition, and I want them to be able to be supported by other trans people who will support them in that. Because the truth is, 
so many of us in the trans community have either been forced to detransition or understand what it would be like to do that. And as it turns out, detransitioners, the real things, not the capital D, T, M, R, as brought to you by PragerU detransitioners. The real people who experience detransition have always had a home in the trans community and have always been welcomed and supported. But this, the way that it's used by the right wing as a political cudgel in their culture war is disgusting, sickening, and harmful. And it should be rejected. Now, you have some of the tools to do so. There is an ongoing moral panic in this country around trans people that is despicable. Trans people are a small and very harmless minority of this country. Most, the vast majority of trans people are not even like myself. You know, I got my little demon horns. I like to talk about politics. Maybe I'm a little dangerous, you know? Ooh, I'm a little edgy. I, I fight back a little bit. Ooh, but the vast majority of trans people just want to live their lives. Just want to live their lives. They just want to be themselves. They want to express themselves truthful to themselves, and they want to live their own lives. And the ongoing moral panic wants you to dehumanize them. The ongoing moral panic wants to frame them as some sort of danger. The ongoing moral panic goes so far as to say that all trans people are inherently dangerous to children, which is disgusting and should be rejected. And part of this moral panic is this misinformation on detransitioning. So hopefully this video is something that you can send to people who you see talking about the detransitioner myths and perhaps some of the arguments and stories I've presented here will be helpful for you if you encounter this type of disinformation. I want trans people to live the best lives possible. I want the far right to leave trans people alone. I want them to stop lying. I want them to stop using us as a cudgel in their disgusting culture war. And I want trans people to be able to thrive free of the yoke of a deranged moral panic um, that involves them being framed uh, as as uh, monsters. Because trans people aren't monsters. None of us. Except for maybe me. Anyway, if you like this video, please press subscribe below. Please leave me your comments if you have similar stories or if you have thoughts about this subject. And also, please be sure to press like. If you know somebody who might benefit from seeing this video, make sure that you press share and share this with your friends and family who might be able to learn from it. Anyway, thank you for watching Demon Mama and much love to all of my imps.